Assalamualaikum and good morning everyone. Uh, I hope that everyone can hear me very well. Yes. Uh, okay, thank you, Chris. Okay, thank you for joining us for today's webinar on technique and applications of CHNS. My name is Dahlia Bukade and I'm the moderator for this webinar. For everyone's information, this webinar is one of many webinars organized by iCream Laboratory in this year, and this webinar is co organized with Thermo Fisher Scientific Syndrome Berhad. The objective of this webinar is to help the participants understand the principle and applications of CHNSO. In addition to creating the platform for instilling practical knowledge and networking, this webinar also aims to create awareness for the high quality analytical services available at iCRIP laboratory. Upon completing this webinar, we hope participants will be able to integrate and apply the knowledge which will be helpful in improving the quality of research and publications. Before we start, I would like to go through some housekeeping rules of this webinar. Please mute your speaker and turn off your video during the webinar. Please submit the questions in the chat box. I will read it, uh, read all the questions during Q and A session. Please fill up the feedback form before the webinar ends. Slides and recording will be emailed after the feedback form has been completed and submitted. Before the web webinar ends, all participants are invited to switch on respective camera for a photography session. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our honourable speaker today. Our speaker is Mr. Chris Chia, application leader from Thermo Fisher Scientific Malaysia. Mr. Chris Chia has uh, an in-depth background on spectroscopy, chromatography, separation and mass spectrometry. Uh, he has more than 15 years experiences on high-resolution accurate mass spectrometer, supporting his customers on both technical and application. Uh, Mr. Chris Chia graduated with a bachelor degree in biochemistry at Tungkap Drama Col uh, College at Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Chris joined Alpha Analytical as application chemist after graduation, expanded his career and become an application and technical manager. He later joined Thermo Fisher Singapore on year 2015. Chris currently is an application leader focusing on inorganic mass spectrometer like organic element analyzer, isotope, isotope, uh, isotope ratio MS and multi-collector MS, supports both both pre-sales and post-sales of the Thermo Fisher Scientific's Chromatography and Mass Spectrometer Division. He has a great passion and in-depth knowledge on the fast-growing research areas such as proteomics, metabolomics, and trace element analysis. So without uh, wasting any more time, uh, I will uh, pass over the platform to you, Chris. Okay. Uh, morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Dalina. So uh, morning, everyone. So. Um, it's great pressure and great opportunity for UKM to invite me in this particular discussion. So I would love to share with you this for these two hours, what is this technology and how it can help us to analyze sample to get a bit, uh, better knowledge about our application and also how it used to create a better world. Okay, so let me share my screen screen right now. Uh, not this one, sorry. Okay. Can you see the slide I'm sharing? Uh, not working. Yes, Chris. Uh, you can see the slide, okay. Yes. But now it's gone already. Okay, I'll try again. Now okay? Ah uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Let me I maybe I turn off my video just to increase the bandwidth. Okay. Uh, the, the, Dalia, do you want to record the session? Uh, yes. We are oh, recording it. Uh, yes. We are recording. Okay, great. Uh. Then we can start. Okay, so the outline for today, um, I will briefly go through on the working principle of what is elemental analyzer. How do we analyze the sample? 
Uh, so there's two terminology that I will introduce. So one of it will be combustion. So how are we going to combust our sample to detect? And the other method that we use will be on pyrolysis. So these two are the common terminology that we use for elemental analyzer. Then I will briefly talk about how do we prepare the sample, how we are going to introduce this to the instrument, the weighing technique, because we will deal with a solid sample, liquid sample, and sometimes a mixture of viscous sample, a mixture between solid and liquid sample. Then on the last part, we will look into some of the key application that this can be done on the elemental analyzer. So it can be in industrial. So maybe um, some of you, after you graduated, you get your bachelor degree. Then when you go to a field, maybe be it a petrochemical field or a food, a food and beverages field. So this instrument will be part of the analytical uh, QC and QA laboratory. So if you have any question, just type in the chat box and I can pause in between each, each uh, section, then we can discuss in detail. Okay. So when you look into this particular instrument, it's called Elemental Analyzer, and it's operate what we call a modified Dumas method. And detection is by this thermal conductivity detector. So this is a detector that detect gases, gases like carbon dioxide, hydrogen, water, nitrogen, and even sulfur dioxide. So actually what does elemental analyzer measure? It only measure this particular five elements, which is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and sulfur. So they done by combustion. Combustion means that we are adding oxygen and burn the entire sample so that the carbon content will be converted to CO2. Hydrogen will then convert to H2. Nitrogen will become N2 and sulfur will become SO2. Okay, so these gases after conversion, they will travel through a column and they will reach a TCD detector. So TCD detector will able to differentiate the concentration and give you the information about percent. So it detects all the way from PPM level, part per million, until percent, 100 percent, for example. So if you look into this instrument, it actually is about analyzer. So it means that it only gives you information about percent of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and sulfur. It doesn't give you the detailed identity of what is the com what is the analyte or what is the organic compound inside. So if you bring a soil sample, which we will discuss in later part, it won't tell you what type of pesticide is inside or what type of polyaromatic compounds inside your sample, but rather it will combust everything and show the result as a total carbon. Oxygen is a bit different. So we done oxygen determination by pyrolysis. Pyrolysis is the term that we use high temperature to heat up the sample in the presence of oxygen. Okay, so oxygen will be converted to carbon monoxide and then also determined by TCD. So depend on the application workflow. So I have customer in soil and sediment lab in environmental laboratory. So they will be interested in total organic carbon. So we can do something like this, but it will require some step in sample preparation. So you need to add in acid to acidify the sample in order to evaporate those inorganic carbon. If you doesn't do any pre-acidification, the result, the carbon result that you are getting will be a total carbon and not total organic carbon. 
Okay. Sulfur analysis will be more on petrochemical analysis for environmental. So today in Singapore it's raining. So we have customer uh, determine, do an investigation or monitoring on environmental uh, raindrop to check on acidic rain. So this is done by sulfur analysis. Okay. So this particular elemental analyzer is a common analyzer that we use to detect this top five element. And if you move to a more uh, sophisticated laboratory, they will couple it to what we call a IRMS. This is the isotope ratio mass spec. So isotope ratio mass spec, if we combine with elemental analyzer, you were able to determine um, quite a variety of information from the sample. For example, forensic, so we can able to check a person, where does he or she come from by hair sample. We can even check this particular honey sample. Is it a true honey sample or is added or adulterated with sugar? So this is quite an interesting topic. Okay, so if you look at organic elemental analyzer, so in simple term, like I explained earlier, it determines carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and sulfur. So be it is an organic or inorganic, it will able to detect. Sample analysis is quite straightforward. So as an operator, as, as a researcher, you will need to weigh the sample. So before weighing, you need to make sure that the sample is homogenized. And this will be discussed in detail at later part. Combustion and reduction, this will be done by instrument. So if I want to oxidize the sample, it will involve CHNS. Reduction will be go for oxygen. We need some sort of chromatography. Chromatography is a separation mechanism where we were able to separate those gases and they will elute in a retention time. Then we can specifically determine this particular retention time is nitrogen, then followed by carbon, hydrogen and sulfur. Of course, detection will be done by TCB. Okay, so there's two application or two terminology that we will do. One is called micro elemental analysis. It involves small sample weight in milligram. So this normally deal with a research in, uh, let's say, environmental sample, drinking water. For petrochemical soil analysis, sentiment waste analysis, we likely go for macro elemental anal analysis, whereby the sample weight will be slightly higher. It will reach about 100 milligram up to about 1000 milligram. Okay, so we have to do how we prepare our sample in the capsule. Okay, so this one, uh, I just flash a slide that I want to show you there's a couple of configuration. So you can see that there's some configuration only analyze protein. And this is by nitrogen. So we only determine nitrogen. So this particular application is actually more suitable for uh, industrial food industrial. For example, those milk product, we have uh, food and beverages, drinking water, and also uh, brewery. Then we have environmental and petrochemical where you will analyze nitrogen and carbon. Nitrogen only in lubricant. So to share with you, uh, in Malaysia, we actually, you, we have quite a huge industry in lubricant, okay, like Petronas, or we have other uh, modifier. So they bring in the petrochemical sample they put in some sort of catalyst to improve the product 
So this is done and they are determining the nitrogen content. The rest of the configuration will separate between uh, environmental sample, forensic, and research and development. So I mentioned about the detector. So detector, this is an overview of a thermal conductivity detector. So very simple, it will use helium gases. And those gases generated, it will actually pass over a filament. You see the table over here? We have a reference and we have a makeup channel. So makeup channel is actually connected to your column. So your compound will go into go through this particular column and they will elute. Reference, it will do a comparison between the compound eluted and the referencing. And they determine the response in terms of filament. And this is recorded by software. Okay. So look at this table. The difference is thermal conductivity of different gases. They will have different value. So this value, uh, it will be recorded by the software. So whenever a gases pass through, the software see the difference, then it will know that, okay, this is hydrogen. This is carbon dioxide. Or even this is carbon monoxide. So all these will have a specific value. So if you look into detail, you will notice that Helium is about 3,000 over. The rest is about 100, in the range of 100. So they are quite different compared to helium. So it means that the detection limit on these gases will be very good and it can reach around PPM level, part per million level, if determined from your sample type. How about hydrogen? I purposely highlight these two number because hydrogen is about 4,000. So it's only a little bit difference. And this is why if we determine hydrogen, it will be on high PPM level. Okay. So how does the sample being um, converted to gases? We are using something called a reactor. So this reactor is the chemistry where it will convert carbon to CO2. So later I have a video to show you uh, how we can pack this reactor. And so this, just give you an idea. This reactor sizes is about, the diameter is about 25 millimeter. Okay, it's about uh, 20 cents to 50 cents uh, sizes. Then the entire reactor will be placed inside a furnace. A furnace is a high temperature furnace. It's always heated. So when the sample get dropped inside, which you will see a video later, it will get combusted. And the carrier gas will actually push them through this reactor and they will get converted. So after conversion, always moisture will be created. So in terms of chemistry, whenever a gases is being created, there's always a byproduct. Moisture or water will be the byproduct. So we will need to filter off the moisture through some magnesium and hydron. So this will actually uh, remove the moisture content because we need to protect our analytical column. Otherwise, your column will be saturated with moisture and the separation will be reduced. Okay, I have a short video to show you how I pack the reactor. Then we can... Okay. okay. So this one of the example how we pack uh, prepare the reactor. Typically, we will change the reactor every 500 to 600 sample analysis and it dependent on sample content. Okay, 
So we will need uh, some material. So, so we will need a quartz wool. Then we will need an empty reactor. Then this is the main ingredient, the copper oxide and the electrolytic copper. So this is just uh, devices that help us to push uh, the ingredient inside. So the system will look like this. So this is the auto sampler where we will put our sample in. So dependent on what type of uh, sample analysis, we will pack the recipe quite different. So this is an example for CHNS. So in one injection, you will determine a total four element consecutively, means that they will elute one after another. So this electrolytic copper will just push in and later we will have some quartz wool to seal the devices. Okay, so you can see that how the quartz wool is being packed. We won't squeeze it, but rather that we will just put a thin layer to separate those um, reagent. So just gently push the way then we just stop there. We won't press hard. Otherwise, you will create blockage and the helium gases will have difficulty to pass through. So the copper oxide is needed on top of electrolytic copper. So if you are wondering, there's a specific dimension or length that we need to follow to make sure that the combustion efficiency is there. Then finally, another one centimeter of quartz wool. And we will put in a quartz crucible. So this quartz crucible is just like a protector for the reactor. So sometimes we our sample might be unknown. We might have inorganic carbon. So the inorganic carbon will be quite difficult to combust. Then it will create something called ash. So when we burn something, then we will have a byproduct. So this is called ash. Okay. So you see how the reactor is being packed earlier. So now you will see this particular schematic diagram. Okay. I mentioned about helium earlier. So now we go through helium. Helium is the carrier gas that it will flow the entire system. So it will flow in two pathways. The one path, first pathway is actually where the sample will going to pass through the copper oxide and ele electrolytic copper. Then it will go through a column for separation and reach the detector of TCB. So this is what we mentioned earlier, the analytical channel. And I will also have a reference channel. Okay, so this channel is not running. So I can only run one channel at any one time. King container is where my sample will be. It will host my sample. And this particular thing is actually the auto sampler. Okay, we will have a video to show you how we pack the sample in the tin container or a tin capsule. So when the sample is located inside the auto sampler, when it drops, oxygen will be injected. In the presence of oxygen, reaction will happen. Okay. So you see the furnace temperature now is about 950 degrees Celsius. For your info, 
tin, SN, is an exothermic material. So when I burn tin material, it will create heat, huge amount of heat. Instantly, this center part of reactor, the temperature will raise in a few seconds to become 1800. From the value of 950, it will go up all the way until 1800 in a few seconds. So this is where your sample will get combusted. So what happened after combusted? Okay, you will form all these um, gases. You will form nitrogen. So this is something that you want. You will form NXOY. So it can be nitro oxide, it can be N2O, it can be NO2, it doesn't matter. We will get it reduced later. Then we have carbon dioxide. So this is what we want. Water, I mentioned about moisture. So this is forming from hydrogen. SO2 is from sulfur. SO3 is something that we don't want. Then what happened? So what will happen to the NXO1 and also SO3? We will reduce them by this electrolytic copper. Okay. So you see from copper oxide, it will generate gases and some of the byproduct. But when you go through the electrolytic copper, the 80 centimeter uh, gold color thing, so now we will have this ultimate four gases that we want, which is nitrogen, carbon dioxide, water, and sulfur dioxide. You remember you have oxygen earlier, so excess of oxygen will also trap in this particular copper. So now this is the four gases that we want. They will just travel all the way, pass through a column. So when they pass through a column, this particular column, it will have a separation behavior and it will able to separate these four gases in a specific elution pattern. So this elution pattern will never change uh, unless something wrong with the column or there's some leakage. So nitrogen will always elute first, followed by carbon, hydrogen and sulfur. So you might have a question, so what if my sample only have carbon and hydrogen? Then you will only get this two pick. So you won't get anything from H or S. Okay, so this entire run will be around 10 minutes. What you need to prepare is just the sample, put in the capsule, and when the system run through sequence, automated sequence, they will inject one by one. And each injection will take about 10 minutes analysis time. So maybe from the same sample, I need to determine a total of five elements. I will also need oxygen. So for O determination, it cannot done on this particular left channel. It need to run on the right channel because the packing material is different. And we done this by hydrolysis or high temperature hydrolysis. Means that without the presence of oxygen. So you see this arrow. So it means that this analytical channel and reference channel now they will change. They will rotate. Reference channel will become analytical channel to handle this particular high temperature pyrolysis of O determination. Sample now doesn't pack or doesn't prep in a tin container, but rather we will pack in a silver container. A different chemistry a different packing material of reactor, 
So now we are using nickel plated carbon and we have a quartz turning. So these two sample will go in. Temperature remain because silver is not an exothermic material. So they will just burn at the same temperature that we set in the instrument method. Okay, what gases it forms? O, oxygen will be converted to carbon monoxide. So maybe you were wondering why O doesn't form O2? Because we doesn't put in oxidation gases like oxygen. So there's no other material. So it can only reduce and form carbon monoxide. But at the same time, it will also form nitrogen and some other gases. And this is why we have this adsorbent filter. So this filter will going to filter away nitrogen and some of the moisture. So nitrogen and carbon monoxide, when it pass through, okay, then the moisture will be um, trapped here. CO2, if present, it will also trap here. Okay, there's no way that we can trap nitrogen because it's always present. So this first peak is actually the N2 peak. The second one is the oxygen. And runtime for this particular O determination will be uh, faster. It's about five minutes. So this is actually how the system works in terms of chemistry to couple with the packing material of reactor as well as how the TCD is being utilized to determine the compound after those compounds is being separated by chromatography. Okay, one point to highlight further is um, this system is in atmospheric pressure. So in our laboratory environment, our air always contain nitrogen. Okay, so how do we make sure that the external environment will not affect our analytical result? Is by helium. So this is why helium will always perch. The term is actually called perch. It will perch through the entire auto sampler to make sure to insulate the system from external uh, influences. So the result that you're getting is truly from your sample. So whenever I start an analysis or when I start a certain project, I always will run a blank sample and I will need to determine the nitrogen blank in my sample. And there's a specific uh, threshold. So it need to be lower than a certain value. For example, um, 3000 millivolt. So it means that my system is intact. There's no leaking. So if there's a leaking, your blank level will be very high and it will influence your final analytical result. So I mentioned about total organic carbon. So this is actually um, some sort of sample preparation or sample pre-treatment that we need to do. Carbon, to determine carbon, we would do it by combustion. So you will remember, <coughs> I would need to use tin capsule. But for total organic carbon, we need to change some of the uh, strategy. So now instead of <coughs> tin capsule, I will need to use a silver capsule. Why? because silver capsule will be more resistant towards hydrochloric acid. A tin capsule is a soft material. So when you add one drop of hydrochloric acid, the tin capsule will mostly melted. Okay, 
So this is why for total organic carbon, we will need to use a silver capsule. We will add our sample, weigh at one drop or two drop of hydrochloric acid. And we look at the chemistry, the appearance of the sample. If a lot of bubbling means that your sample has a lot of inorganic carbon. Because when the hydrochloric acid is being added, it will vaporize the inorganic carbon. Okay. The rest of the sample, after inorganic carbon being evaporated, those remaining will be organic carbon. We will live at about 65 degrees Celsius, about 10 to 20 minutes normally <clears throat> in a normal film hood. So it will dry and we will analyze. So um, for TOC, a total organic carbon, this application normally will be more beneficial for environmental soil and sediment, where we want to analyze the TOC content in um, soil sample. Okay, so I mentioned about tin capsule, I mentioned about silver capsule. So how do we load the sample and how the system will going to introduce the sample into the system? So it's actually by this rack. So you see that there's four drum. Okay, so our sample will go into this slot. So every slot or every drum, one layer will host about close to about 30 sample. So if you have more sample, then you need a uh, more layer, just like that. Okay, furnace temperature. So remember, it's set at about 950 to about 1000 degrees Celsius. When your sample go in, the exothermic reaction of tin, it will increase it to about 1800 degrees. Okay, so let's have a video on how the sample being introduced. Okay, so this is only one layer of the auto sampler and this is a uh, three layer. Uh, sorry about the gas tubing uh, connection. So you see that this is actually the furnace. You can actually see the furnace light because it's heated up to about 1000 degree. So the entire tube will be um, it will be like in orange color, it will like a uh, grow uh, reactor. And when your sample is introduced, you will see the color will actually change slightly. You wait for the sample to drop. Okay, here. So you see the color become bright. So when it's bright, that's the time where the temperature raised to about 1800 and your sample is being combusted. Uh, you just ignore the black color thing. The black color thing is that how the auto sampler introduced the sample. Okay, we can go through again. So this is the normal color now at about 9, 000, uh, 900 to 1000 degrees Celsius. And you see the number nine, it will actually move there. And your sample now go in. Okay, so bright color means that your sample is being combusted. So this is where the chemistry will start and your compound now converted to gases. So after converted to gases, then it will follow the schematic diagram that I showed you earlier, where it will start to get reduced, start to travel through the column and then get detected. So this I show you is actually more on solid sample. So how about liquid? Liquid is quite tough to prepare in the capsule 
So we have an auto injector that we can inject our sample. So this is particularly interesting for some laboratory that they are monitoring um, water sample. It can be sea water sample or it can be environmental water sample. Okay, where the liquid sample will be injected directly. Okay, so TCD is a detector that we always use for the five element that I mentioned earlier. FPD is a more selective detector. Um, we will use this for acid rain uh, determination, which I mentioned to you earlier. It will be down to about 10 ppm to 100 ppm concentration. Okay. Okay. Uh, I will pause here for a while. Any question? Is there any question in the chat box? No question, Chris. Okay, good. Then maybe I'll continue. So how do we prepare the sample? Whenever we are preparing the sample, we need to understand this term sample homogenation. So this will affect your result. And in terms of chemistry, this is the most important topic or whenever we are trying to start a project on the elemental analyzer. Because this will determine whether your final result is accurate and repeatable okay so majority of the material are often unhomogeneous so this is why we need to make sure that they are well blended we get a substantial amount of sample mix them well and make sure that we can reproduce the data So to let you have a better idea, uh, it depends on your sample nature. Some of the sample is actually dry and soft material. So this has to do with food product, plant tissue. So it's easier. You can just use a roto speed mill to spin them, to cut them into smaller pieces or smaller particle size. When you are dealing with rock sample, soil, sediment, it will be a bit hard. Okay, so either uh, if you can, you can use a mortar to do it. Otherwise, uh, you can use a crushing mill, then to grind them further with a ball mill. Okay, other food product like dry, wet, soft material, um, those meat processed meat that we can get in supermarket, it will contain uh, sulfur material. We can use scissor or even blade to cut it. Or you can even use a blender to do it. Okay. So some of the idea on sample and what are the appropriate tools that we can use to process it. Okay. So this is one example of a ball mill. That typical application will be on pharmaceutical when we are grinding the peels. Then we have soy, natural product from leaf and plant. So wood material for petrochemical will be more on coal and coke. So this type of uh, blending is actually more for Software material, animal feed, food sample, uh, seed, polymer. Polymer is more for industrial analysis, uh, waste material.
some sample doesn't require sample homogenation. So sample like uh, gasoline, diesel, oil sample, lubricant sample in petrochemistry uh, industry doesn't require homogenation. Means that I can straight away prep the sample, load the auto sampler, start my analysis. Okay. Sample like food sample, juices, wine, material like cotton. So this one we can cut into smaller pieces and we can burn in the sample. Environmental sample in terms of pollution, how do we filter a contamination particulate matter? So this is quite interesting. So you see there's a filter paper. So I can just run one liter of wastewater or one liter of environmental water through this filter. Afterwards, we dry the filter in oven. So why we need to dry it? Because we want to remove water content. Okay, so after we dry it, we can cut them, fold into a capsule, start analysis. So those examples I mentioned earlier is more on solid sample. So what if I have liquid sample? Liquid sample separated into quite a few categories, I would say. So simple one will be a non-volatile liquid sample. It can be viscous. It can be just a normal viscosity sample. So this one normally we weigh in a traditional soft tin container. Then we have volatile sample. So maybe you heard about pollution in uh, our river water. So if you want to determine the content of TOC in those river water, so some of, sometimes they may contain volatile material. So we can treat them as a volatile liquid and this round, we need to use slightly hard tin container. So why soft tin container is not possible on volatile liquid? Because we cannot close the capsule nicely. So it may get evaporated and turn out the result is not repeatable. Okay. So I have a video to show you how we can absorb the liquid sample into a chromosome layer. If there's too much liquid sample, so maybe one day you need to analyze two liquid sample, uh, then fine. You can prepare in the condition, uh, conventional way of capsule. If you need to run like 100 sample, it's not productive. And you will spend a lot of time weighing the sample. So this is why we will use automated liquid injection. So your sample will be kept in a 2 mil HPLC valve or a GC valve. Then auto sampler will inject the sample, liquid sample, direct to the system. Okay, so some of the application for your info, which normally will utilize liquid auto sampler, uh, water analysis. We can even run urine sample, a blood sample. So for FMB, food and beverages will be those soft drink, orange juice, wine, or even beer. So the rest is some of the example which you can go through it. So in our industrial right now, there's a lot of reference method or what they call an official method. So I purposely highlight a few just to give you some context. So in our vast uh, industry, how researcher or how QA QC lab is utilizing Elemental Analyzer to determine their product. 
okay? In Syria, those conflict, those uh, cereal that we purchase from supermarket, they will analyze and protein content. Okay, so they need to determine the protein level in their sample. So today, maybe afterwards, you go to supermarket, you pick up one of the cereal boxes, you look at the labeling. So they will put in the protein level, how many percent. So this is done by elemental analyzer. Uh, animal feed, we can just ignore them, okay? So it's more for like the farmer. So whenever they purchase the animal feed, then they will check the protein content. So right now, under current global situation, like we have issue on food change and material of those uh, chicken, meat increases mostly due to the increased cost of animal feed so that's why the costing increases so animal feed you don't underestimate there's a lot of in company big company in our region i would say our region and also the europe region they are manufacturing animal feed so the improved quality in terms of the protein level. So when we determine protein digestibility, it has to do with nitrogen content. The higher content, they can just refer to that maybe this is a better quality. Then they can sell at the higher pricing. So this is how instrumentation is being utilized to improve the quality of the product so that they can market it better. So other example will be in meat, grain, oil seed. Okay, oil. So we have a normal cooking oil, then we have a more expensive olive oil. So some is like extra light olive oil. So this is actually determined on the nitrogen content. So moving on from food and beverages, we go into those petrol lubricant that we always use. So why we have uh, engine oil, a full synthetic, semi-synthetic, okay? So this is all done by elemental analyzer. So this is called lubricant. So ASTM is a common method or a referencing method that most laboratory will use uh, this particular d5291 is a common method that a lot of petrochemistry lab are running so they will determine carbon hydrogen and nitrogen in their petroleum product okay so o in gasoline and I talk about TOC, so this is why I highlighted N and C and TOC in soil sample. Okay. So when we need to weigh the sample, weighing balance is one of the key influencer. So if you doesn't get the correct weight, you will suffer at later part. So you will start to wondering why your result is not repeatable. Maybe today you weigh this sample, three replicate, you get a very good data, but the next day, when you try to repeat it, you cannot recover the same result. So this has to do with microbalance. So this is one example of the microbalance that I'm using. So I need a readability. What we mean by readability means that it can measure down to 0 0.001 milligram, equivalent to one microgram of read readability. Why this is important? Putting a context, how much sample we need to weigh into a particular capsule, it has to determine based on your project basis. So if your project, you only need to analyze N 
content in food material, then typically it will be around 10 to 1 gram, 10 milligram to 1 gram. For soy sample, it will be around 1 milligram to 1 gram. So normally I will work around 100 milligram. <clears throat> For most of the sample, if we need a total analysis of five elements, I will work around 10 to 20 milligrams. So how do I determine it? It depends on the carbon content. Okay, giving an example, if you have idea about your sample type, if it's more than 50% carbon, we will weigh around 2 to 3 milligrams. Anything less than 10% carbon, we will go up to about 10 to 15 milligrams. The question I always got is, I have no idea about my sample. So which sample weight should I use? So we will try with around 5 to 10 milligrams. And we will develop the method. We look at the data. If the data is repeatable, then it's the correct value to use. Otherwise, we will try to reduce the sample weight or sometimes increase it. But 1 to 10 milligram is actually the correct amount most of the time. I would say 95%, 1 to 10 milligram is the correct value to use. Okay, so let's look at how we prepare the solid sample in a capsule. So this is a solid sample in a tin container. So you have a micro balance, you need a uh, two tweezer. Uh, you understand why we need a tweezer later. So the thin capsule is this tiny stuff. Then we will perform tag. So we take down the capsule. So use a spatula. So according to the guideline earlier, so let's try about two to five milligram. So this is why we need two tweezer. We will actually fold the capsule and make into a small tiny aluminum foil slide. Okay, so this is how we prep the sample. So this is the capsule, and next we need to we need to take the, we need to record the sample weight. So it's approximately two point five. So the three decimal point of the milligram is important. So we need to input. 2.496 into the software sequence. Okay. So the first time I try weighing the sample, uh, so my hand will be a bit shaky. So it will took me about five minutes just to prep one sample. So when you get practice, you will be more comfortable. So now every sample, maybe you took me less than a minute then I'll able to prep it. So this is another example, but rather it's not um, solid, it's liquid sample. So we will use a chromosome. So chromosome is just like a powder material. 
that allow liquid to be absorbed on it to help when we need to fold the capsule. So slightly different material. So right now I will form this particular tin container. So it's a slightly, slightly bigger one. So same, we take the sample weight and then perform a test. So this chromosome will be inserted So perform second round of tank because we need the eventual actual sample weight. Okay, so this liquid sample, it can be, I have no idea why this, maybe this is a milk product. Yeah. So just add a few drops. And the way we close the capsule will be slightly different. So right now we will actually seal it better. Instead of like the solid sample earlier, we just fold it multiple times. So right now this is like a disc. And we will record the value. So the capsule once prepared, it will go on top of the auto sampler. Okay. So why I mentioned that uh, micro balance repeatability is important. Okay. So this to show you the typical result. So we are using one material. Uh, so the name is sulfonylamide. So it contains a total of four elements. So under one inject, uh, one analysis, you were able to get this four value. Analytical balance is around 0.01 gram readability. So a lot of time it cannot read the milligram better. So you see that some of the result, expected result, is fall out of the acceptance range and it will cause some problem. Yeah, because you will start to wondering why your result is not accurate. So a lot of time you have to do with sample handling, how we are weighing the sample. So on microbalance, I mentioned earlier that we need to record up to three decimal points minimum and it will make sure that all your result is within acceptable range for any qa qc lab whenever they run the sample what they want is to make sure that their product is always within their limit and they have developed their method they always use the same sample weight so what they want is actually getting this accurate result with a good standard deviation. Okay, so this is another example where we analyze um, the result and sometimes you see if you are getting a correct weight and your carbon content, okay, your readability and standard deviation is better. Some sample, you got no choice. The carbon content is quite low so this is why you need to work and then determine the correct sample weight and your percent RSD will be better. Limit of detection is to determine your method and instrument, how low it can detect. Limit of quantitation is how low I can quantitate. So LOD and LOQ 
is actually based on the lowest concentration that the method can detect and quantitate. So a guideline is very simple. So we will run a 10 independent, 10 consecutive injection of blank capsule. Okay. So we make sure that we can detect them and we will use a standard deviation to determine. So I mentioned about official method earlier. So this, uh, if you have in, um, if you have more time, then you can just read through this. So this is some common generic official method that the industry is using. So mainly in petrochemistry, environmental, um, agronomy is a terminology for agriculture study. So Malaysia, we are dealing a lot with agriculture. So agronomy is determined on how I can improve the plantation efficiency, how researcher can help, um, I would say, um, farmer to improve their um, agriculture yield because we can determine the content we can help in fertilizing. So fertilizer is also one of the topic where we will use elemental analyzer to determine. Marine sciences. Marine sciences maybe will be more active in east, uh, east coast of Malaysia, like in Terengganu or Kelantan, where they are determined on the coral. So to do a study, how we can protect the coral better, to understand how the coral behave to a different season, okay? How pollution is affecting them. So I'll just skip this. This is ASTM method on determination of CHN. Okay. When we are correcting our results or when we are publishing our result in journal publication, you always need to refer to a certain international standard, what we call a certified reference material. So imagine today you are dealing, you are starting a project. Your project is to determine CHN content in soil sentiment okay so you collected some sample you done your thesis you done your project on this soil result and you want to publish your result to improve your publication to improve the amount of citation you will need to correct your result to an international standard means that it's better to purchase a reference standard, run it on the same method, and make sure that you can achieve the acceptable range. Okay? So globally, people are creating reference material, and they are selling this commercially to help researchers in this community to have a reference material, to compare your result, to evaluate whether their method is robust. So in order to create this reference material, there's one thing called a round robin test. A round robin test means that if I create a reference standard, I will send to about 30 participate lab. So they will run it, they will return with the result to tell me how many percent of carbon nitrogen present in my sample. Then they will do statistic. They will determine which is correct, which is within the range, and then they will determine the acceptable range. So this is a common uh, round robin test program that happened throughout the entire analytical community. For elemental analyzer. 
and they focus on specific analysis. So our last part of our discussion today will be focusing application. So I Elementor Analyzer, there's a lot of application can be done, but I will try to pick those like quite interesting and it will expand your horizon on how this analytical method can be used in not only research, but also in applied market. Apply market means that in our industry, how it affects our supplement, how it affects our dietary without us knowing. So I summarize a uh, top six market or application field that commonly elemental analyzer method will be deployed. Without you knowing, the pharmaceutical and organic chemistry market. Petrochemistry, I think mean, this is quite common. So we know that chem petrochemical will always use elemental analyzer. Environmental, mention about agriculture research, marine sciences, material characterization. So when we heard about material, Maybe we can imagine uh, your car tires. So why certain tires are more expensive? Because they are more durable. Some are cheaper, more economic, but it won't last so long. So what are the material that going to affect this? So this is all done and determined by Elemental Analyzer. Food safety has to do with our food chain analysis. So this one I'll leave you for you to read yourself. So a common application analysis for this particular um, application market and how the laboratory is using elemental analyzer to detect. Okay. So for environmental, maybe because we have concern about environmental, so it have to do with sewage pesticide, the water solution, and a lot of things on air pollution. Yeah, this year uh, we haven't got haze. So whenever haze return, so a lot of researchers will actually revisit this topic. Air particulate, particulate so they will filter, then they determine. So when it coupled with a mass spec, we were able to determine the origin of this air pollution or this haze. So Korea, there's a team, a researcher team that they analyze air particulate. So they can, I wouldn't say that they try to figure out, but rather it's a project basis to create awareness. So they collected the, uh, air filter so they plot a curve so they were able to determine the pollution is actually be it generated locally or is actually from external so this is quite an interesting paper to go through so organic compound i think melamine is not common uh, it's not unknown to us so it's a common terminology that we a chemical that we know so have to do with protein, okay? So, and this is some of the analysis that it can run. Uh, pharmaceutical, cholesterol, uh, nicotinic acid, caffeine. So these are some of the organic compounds that we can determine the percent carbon and hydrogen. For pharma, a lot of antibiotic so when we need to analyze bulk analysis, uh, they will need to determine. So during manufacturing, a quick check on their product, make sure that there's no impurity and they need to label the, their product correctly. So this is done by Elemental Analyzer. 
so for CHNS um, solution, so for example, liquid sample, then we will go direct with um, liquid injection. So this has to do with rubicon and isooctane solution. Okay. Petrochemistry and energy. So these are the common analysis that um, people are doing. Um, I want to highlight on biofuel and biomass because right now in the current development, um, there's a lot of researchers focusing on biomass and they are trying to determine whether biomass can actually, I wouldn't say 100% replace, but rather how they can be a constituent energy sources to biofuel. Okay. Sulfur content in oil, a total oxygen in gasoline, and a common application which is nitrogen content in rubicon. So in Singapore alone, that at an industrial area, we got at least like 10 to 20 customers that running on this particular analysis. And they have their own um, recipe in their rubicon. So they add own catalyst. So it's their own market and how they're going to promote their product, differentiate from others. So this is why analysis of catalyst is important. Okay, so if we look into this in more detail, how do we prepare the sample? I mean the entire workflow. So we talk about sample homogenation. So we need to take a more representative sample. So for example, minimum, we would need to take about one kilogram. So it's rock sound. So it's quite huge. So we need to break them by ham uh, hammer into smaller pieces. So after that, we will go through a ball mill. So a ball mill will actually help to homogenize and so-called to blend the sample into smaller ID. So typically will be less than 0.2 millimeter. Then we will get this form. So cold meal, maybe they will have moisture. So this is why we need to dry. We about one gram will be sufficient because the sample weight we are taking is about milligram. So one to five gram will be sufficient. So we will dry in oven. So dry in oven is just to remove moisture. Then afterwards, go to the same process where we will weigh the solid sample into a thin capsule. Put on top of the auto sampler, analyze. CHNS by combustion, oxygen by pyrolysis. Okay, so this is the workflow for uh, solid sample for petrochemistry. So based on this, they will determine whether their product is actually in good production order. And QAQC will always need to determine it and make sure that their product is always within the acceptable range. So if something goes, goes wrong or they observe certain abnormally, then immediately they will feed back to manufacturing. So this is how QAQC lab serve as a final product check and inform their manufacturing counterparts. Biomass, okay, interesting topic, biomass. We talk about wood pellet, we talk about sunflower pellet. So how are we going to use this to substitute biofuel? Okay, so a lot of analysis or research development done currently on biomass and also on the pyrolysis oil. Okay, so they want to determine whether this will produce sufficient energy. 
environmental. I mentioned about acid rain monitoring, particulate matter in water and air. Industrial wastes. So at certain part of the country in our region, Southeast Asia region, so there's more pollution. So some of them government will be more stringent in terms of monitoring the waste dumpage and also the industrial wastes to environment. So this is why water content, air content will be monitored. So how do we do it? So by um, environmental, so we can go through this page first. For particulate matter in water, just go through a glass or quartz filter. We want a good representative of sample. So typically we will pass through one liter to two liter of sample type through the filter. Afterwards, we dry the filter. If you are not running it, store in the desiccator. Then cut into certain section. So this one cut into about approximately less than 50 millimeter. Then fold it, put in the tin capsule, and you continue to analyze. So we can run total nitrogen, total carbon. If you wish to analyze total organic carbon, so the pre sample acidification will come in. Okay. Other monitoring work will be like uh, monitor certain plantation leaf to check that is there any industrial area that always uh, emit uh, toxic gases or pollute the environment. So they will go to the industrial zone. So there's of, of course always there's a tree, so they will collect the leaf. So the leaf, they will dry it, remove the moisture, grind it, then analyze. So this is the approach. The same thing can be done to monitor acid rain. So acid rain, if you monitor CHN, uh, it doesn't have much um, meaning. So rather we will actually monitor sulfur content. Okay, so you look at this particular column on sulfur percentage. Okay, a particular uh, sample from third zone and fourth zone, uh, maybe this is less acid rain because the amount is about 30 ppm compared to 0.1%. Uh, 1% uh, 1 is equivalent to 10,000 ppm. So this is about 1,000 ppm. Okay. So this is using uh, as uh, environmental monitoring. Compost and sludge so this is more on wastes and how we can convert sludge and compost into agricultural work. So TOC and TOC, uh, TC, total carbon and total organic carbon. So environmental sample. So seawater typically range will be around 1 to 2 ppm of TOC as compared to lake water. Okay. Okay. Agronomy. I think we just focus on soil. So whenever we analyze soil content, it has to do with agriculture whether the soil is get polluted with certain activity. So the process is more or less identical. Take sample, do a filtration, sieve them, dry it. Determine whether you need to run TOC 
or you run a total nitrogen and carbon. Okay, if TOC as certified, if not, direct analysis. Fertilizer is always one of the main topic for agronomy. So why certain fertilizer is more expensive? Because the quality is better. So how do we determine the quality is better? You have to do with content of nitrogen. Then we determine whether the nitrogen content is actually repeatable and reproducible. And also important that we need to make sure that sulfur content is repeatable. So last two um, application field on marine sciences. So this is quite interesting on sentiment in marine sciences. So they go to a sea level and by some of the mechanism, they were able to grab the box at the bottom of the sea level. Take the sample and then analyze. So they want to monitor the contamination and also more on the ecology uh, evolution. So whether some pollution from other part of the world is bringing algae and plankton. So maybe you heard about seaweed. So there's seaweed plantation. So how we can determine the seaweed is actually edible non-polluted is actually done by elemental analyzer okay last one material characterization so i only focus on uh, plastic so plastic so this is how we an, uh, analyze additive and plastic so without homogenation we can compare the result okay and another one will be on a rubber and tires okay so rubber and tire sulfur content is very important so it's actually the most crucial measurement in the quality control of the rubber product okay so you can see that uh, a new tire there's a value uh, just one example one manufacturer of tire the new tire it will be around 2.6%. So after you use the tire for six months, one year down the road, the sulfur content will actually start to go off. So it's called sulfur blooming phenomena. So losses of tire, and it will determine the durability of uh, tire. So this is how the manufacturer of tire is monitoring this. Carbon fiber, so it's also part of the interesting topic. So we determine on the strength, whether they are chemical resistant. It's actually quite popular in civil engineering, uh, motorsport. So um, tire content on high carbon. So there's a specific analytical method from ASTM so to determine that how they can calculate based on the sample make sure that the coal and ethylene is actually detected okay so uh, last few slides so we will go through the food product so I think meal is quite interesting so this have to do with food and beverages so a lot of time is not only on the milk product, but rather food packaging, food transportation. So we want to make sure that during this process, the quality of the food doesn't change. So they have to monitor the nitrogen content in this product at factory level, as well as after packaging, when it distributes to market. A uh, brewery is another method of doing it. They will do it start from the raw material 
all the way until packaging and distribution. Uh, if customer in Philippines and Vietnam, uh, they are doing something more interesting. And uh, this will be the last second slide. So why, what is insect food and animal feed? Okay. So there's certain protein level and from this type of sample type. So some of the sample, uh, is quite interesting, but I never try any of them. So it's actually a small cricket, okay? And they have certain flavor, okay, pasta. So they try to prove to the community or to the consumer, to the consumer that um, it contain high protein level. So how do they do it? So mainly by nitrogen determination. So they don't have to understand what are the analyte or compound inside. So rather, they will just grind the sample, determine the total nitrogen. So this is why you can see some of their food packaging. They will say that for every 100 gram or 200 gram of sample, they will have at least 50% is protein. Okay. So with this, I will actually stop my discussion. And this is the technology of elemental analyzer I want to share with you. Give you some insight how we can use this to create a project, be it the project to monitor environmental pollution or apply this technology or this instrumentation in industrial. Okay. So hope this one give you a good overview on elemental analyzer. Okay, any question? Uh, hi, Chris. Uh, I have a question. For the yes. for, for, for solid samples, you said that uh, it depends on the carbon, uh, if you know the uh, roughly the carbon percentage to weigh the sample, right? So you mm. can use roughly about uh, the, 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 the one that you suggested. What about mm. if the samples in liquid, what is the best volume to weigh if I don't have any uh, liquid sampler? Okay, if you don't have any liquid sample, um, you can use a chromosome like just now I show in the video. Mm -hmm. And typically we will start with around 10 milligram. 10 milligram, if we convert to the drop, it will be around three to four drop of three sample. Two. But yes. what, okay, uh, because I have a very uh, small uh, silver uh, capsule for capsule. the liquid. Ah, yeah, I yes. use the very yeah. small one. Uh, so then, it's... Uh, you need to change to a bigger, uh, what we call a large tin container. Large, all right, okay. Yes, yeah, you can, there's uh, different sizes. Yeah. That's one, yeah no, normally come with system default use will be small capsule yeah and there's a bigger capsule for liquid okay the one that i have is a very small one so okay yes yeah i think two millimeter something like that <laughs> exactly okay uh and then uh another question um um uh is it uh necessary to use uh catalyst such as a vanadium pentoxide in our analysis Provided you if, if you are analyzing sulfur. Okay. Yeah. If you want Without, to check on sulfur only. Yes, because vanadium pentoxide is an oxygen donor. Okay, it donate oxygen, and it help to convert sulfur to SO two. Okay. So we do not. Yeah, uh, researcher do notice that. If you want to analyze sulfur, uh, vanadium pentoxide will actually help to improve the conversion. But if you're running only on CHN, uh, not necessary. 
Oh, uh, we okay. don't add actually. Okay, okay, all right. Thank you, uh, Chris. There's a one question in the chat box from Tusha. Um, she's asking, um, I would like to know if I can use the elemental analyzer to identify whether my chemical attached to target chemical I want. Uh, the answer is no, because um, elemental analyzer is a bulk analyzer. It only gives you a total content, but it won't give you the information about what are the organic compound, whether you are managed to modify it or attach a certain modification to your original compound. So you might need to use a technology like GCMS or LCMS to, de to determine based on molecular weight. Okay. So uh, uh, that's great. Uh, and then another question from Dr. Shivkanya Fuloria. And she, uh, and, uh, okay, uh, the question is, how can we utilize CHN analyzer in pharmaceutical industry, especially in drug analysis? Okay, doctor, for drug analysis, if you want to determine what are the uh, organic compound or what are the drug specific compound, in pharmaceutical uh, industry, you will need to use GCMS or LCMS. And elemental analyzer usage in pharmaceutical is more on getting the nitrogen content as well as the sulfur content. It's not so much on how we determine what are the ingredients that present or what are the drug present in the pharmaceutical. Okay, sure. Um, is there any other questions from the participants? Okay, I think that's all the questions from the participant, uh, Chris. Okay, then uh, I will share the slide with you later. Then you can help share with the participant so that oh, okay. they can. Yeah. Uh, one more question, uh, uh, Chris, uh, from Naimatu Hani. For accuracy, the daily factor range for CHNSO is what range? Okay, for accuracy, uh, daily factor means that if we uh, analyze within a day or uh, intraday comparison. If within a day, you should get standard deviation less than 0.1%. Yeah, means it's in short answer, it should be repeatable and accurate. If intraday, that means day to day comparison, so it depends on your system performance. So we have to make sure that the system is leak free and your calibration curve will repeatable in at least one week or two weeks. Most of my customer, they will recalibrate the system every two weeks. <clears throat> so it means that if today I plot the calibration curve, my sample gives me nitrogen content of 0.7%. It should be 0.7 or 0.69 to 0.71 within the entire week. Next week, maybe there's a requirement to recalibrate the system. That's the typical performance. Okay. I think that's it, Chris, from uh, questions from everyone. So um, it looks like um, we've covered all the questions. Uh, I can, uh, and uh, we have come to the end of our webinar today.
I would like to thank again to speaker and everyone for joining us. Before we end, uh, just to remind, please complete the feedback form in the chat box. And uh, for information on item service, please contact us through the following channel in the chat box. Uh, okay, uh, we're we going to have a photo session. I hope that everyone can switch on uh, your camera. Photo session. We have about um, no, okay, only a few of us that uh, sit on the camera. Okay, is there any more? Okay. Okay, one, two, three, smile. Okay. Okay, that's all. Only only one page for camera. Okay. I see. Okay. I think that's all, Chris. Thank you, Chris, again. Uh for uh, uh for the webinar. So I'll see you guys. Okay, okay I think sure. uh, so okay. with this we we're going to end our session for today. Thank you everyone. Please don't forget to uh fill in the feedback form and also the um attendance form. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye bye. Take okay. Care. Thank you, Chris. Thanks.